Hello and welcome to the Customer Acquisition Show. I'm your host, Tom Meredith, VP of Marketing here at Tier 11, and I'm joined by Common, often showing up, probably monthly at this point, guest Landon. Welcome back, yeah, Landon. Happy to be here. I've got it set, just kind of recurring, the monthly guest in my calendar, so happy to be back. Yeah, we're happy to hear have you here, and I, I know you and I, you know, we end up chatting quite a bit, even outside of the show, if you can believe it. Like. We're really doing some pretty uh, fun stuff really around this awareness, consideration, and conversion uh, model that we're really pushing, leaning into. And I think it's probably the, the big next evolution for digital marketing. Is it evolution or like, rev like going back to the basics a little bit? I don't know. Maybe we, we could just call it a revolution. It's the next yeah. revolution in marketing. Right. It's just It's funny that you think about like revolution is really just kind of coming back, even though it is throwing off the authorities <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it, it's so true it, it really is really getting back to the fundamentals of marketing which is rooted in just addressing human behavior so i, I really do agree i think it is just really distilling things down to its simplest form and just using our marketing to support that yeah, and I've been going down like quite this rabbit hole with like Les Bennett and you know Peter Field and their all their studies around um, they call it brand building versus activation, which is basically analogous to a, awareness, consideration, and conversion. And it's really the fundamentals don't really change, even as you watch their reports from 2006, 2010, I think 2018. Like even though digital is becoming a bigger part of it the brand building still lives on mass media mm -hmm. and it hasn't changed at all. Maybe the, there's more mass media now, with like YouTube a little bit and some of these other um, over the air or like Hulu's and I guess at this point now Netflix and Disney plus you'll be able to advertise on like this idea of brand building just continues to maintain. Um, but as part of that deep dive, I've also been going back to a lot of the Ogilvy stuff. Cause I'm like, mm. thinking about like, what's a good brand building advertiser look like? But you go to Ogilvy and he's basically a, a DR advertiser hiding inside of a brand advertiser's clothing, clothing, which I think is kind of where we're headed right now. Yeah, I agree. I think so much of what we do today is rooted in just like the origins of everything. You know, I would just listen to a, like a sales book for like a very specific reason of something I was trying to listen to. And it was, believe it was created in like the 60s and it's like the same principles that we utilize today that were being taught in like in the 60s and you can see so much of when you go back to like the ogilvy or you know the the Bennett and field study or like the sales training in the 60s it's still being taught today it's just the the means of how it's being executed have changed so we've gone from radio and tv to social media so it's like the strategy and the foundation is the same but the tactics and how it's executed on a day-to-day -day basis is just it's just moved because where people put their attention has changed absolutely and with these platform these social media platforms they are very good at converting people to your customer is better than I don't know I, I would th I'd hazard a guess better than like direct mail pieces or other activations that you would experience have experienced before social media but I think that is also tricking us and if you look at the title of this episode it's like why running conversion campaigns to cold traffic is a waste of money like we get sucked into this idea that well Facebook can convert anybody mm -hmm. we go dump all of our money there. Tell us why that is a falsehood. Yeah, I think if we, it's almost like if we go back to like the old school origins of direct response marketing, the three key components were like your list, your offer and the creative. So the list, like so much of the success of what you were doing was created by your list, having a highly targeted, highly curated list of people that you're marketing to and putting the right offer in front of those people. And I think that potentially what's happened is with the level of sophistication of the algorithms, we've got into the habit of thinking we can just put a conversion ad in front, put it on Facebook, and that we're just going to make money. And I think that 
if we go back maybe like what 10 years or more like the early stages of these things where people made a boatload of money just advertising on facebook because it was so new they were first to market it wasn't saturated people weren't seeing ads on these platforms now the algorithms have got so good that they're able to to pick out that that low hanging fruit but it's just not that simple anymore we've got the the marketing as a whole is starting to evolve we've got the privacy changes we're losing the ability to have those highly targeted audiences and all of those same data points that we did 4 to 5 years ago and for me as soon as like those I, the iOS 14 privacy changes hit my first response was this is great because it's going to create separation between the people that were just getting by from facebook is making them money and the people that are going to rise are going to be the individuals that are able to understand how marketing works as a whole and then start to implement that through social media and i think that's where we're at now is we can't just rely on the platform to do all of the work for us as much as the platforms want to try and you can still see success and maybe on smaller scales but when we're talking about building brands and creating impacts and you know not spending $100 a day you know $2000 a month in ad spend we're talking about clients that are spending 50 100 500,000 dollars a month in ads that's a much different game that we're playing and on that level how we approach marketing has to be fundamentally different yeah and at that level you can't use conversion ads to grow your audience basically you, you have to use these other tools to expand your future customers and it's a, maybe it's a hard conversation and a hard transition for you know either long long term advertisers or people who are scaling their budgets like how do you start to have these conversations with clients and brands about, well, this, I know this looks good right now, but if you want to go to here, here is what we need to do differently. And yeah. the results are not going to be what you want. Yeah, you said something key there. You said you can't use conversion ads to grow your audience. And it's there's a little nuance in there that people kind of tuning in might not pick up on. It's the difference of short-term versus long-term thinking. And that's kind of how I think about it. And I think if we go a step further, a lot of people teaching what's going on today, it worked for them because they they did it five years ago or six years ago or seven years ago, and they're still teaching the same means to go about doing business and it doesn't work anymore. When we want to start to think of how do we go about building an audience, how do we go about communicating this, it's really going to the fundamentals of there is going to be a point of diminishing returns when you understand how these platforms work. Facebook's trying to go out, if you have running a conversion ad, it's trying to go out and find the most likely people to convert. And as that small pool of people that it, it identifies starts to get saturated and you have fewer of those people, you have a level of diminishing returns. Anybody who's ran Facebook ads knows that the more you spend, the less efficient it gets which just means that you, there is not as many of those people inside of that few percent that's ready to purchase right now that they're there anymore. So when you focus on just running conversion ads, you're effectively creating a problem for yourself in the future. And once you run into a problem of my ads are no longer efficient, all of my costs have increased, I'm no longer profitable, that's when most companies start to spend less money. We can start to understand the problem that's going to come up in the future and we can address that beforehand we know that the problem is going to be a pool of people that are interested in our product and service so if we just start to pull those those low-hanging fruit off of the tree we can know we're gonna we're gonna run out of low-hanging fruit we need to wait for them to grow back like this is, it's just like it's it's very simple but we can start to build that audience while we're running those conversion ads so that we can start to lessen the effect of that happening in the future. It's not an easy conversation to have with clients. It's a thing that anytime it comes with communication with this to, to customers, I find that just being very open, honest, and transparent is the easiest way to do things. And just trying to show and demonstrate so that it's as simple as possible for them to understand. So usually showing numbers, case studies, and things of that nature. 
but it, it's tricky because some of the things that we're talking about aren't very easy to measure. And when we can't necessarily measure the exact effectiveness of what we're doing in a short-term window, people kind of cling up and kind of get a little resistant to doing those things. So it's definitely not a, an easy kind of conversation to bridge with, with your clients. I know you've had, I don't know if it was directly related to this concept, but I know you had a, a pretty um, deep diving, tough conversation with one of your clients in the last week or two around, I think a launch of a new product and their mm -hmm. targets. And you had to really come in and understand how they were thinking and help them see it in a different way. You, you kind of tell us that story a little bit and how yeah, that I kind of I kind of find these conversations fun sometimes because it kind of allows me to put my detective hat on and kind of really start to dig into the numbers. And I'm old school. Someone on our team asked me, like, if they could see the spreadsheet I use. And I was like, I wrote all of this out on a piece of paper with a pen as I was doing the math. But so the client came to us and they had a, a new funnel for a new offer that they wanted to launch. And they told us what their, their goals were, which was to break even. A very common goal in kind of the lead generation and information businesses online is to break even on the front end so that we can make all of the profit on the back end, which all makes sense, except I've ran, you know, upwards of nine to $10 million for these types of offers and ads over the last year. And I've owned a lot of these businesses myself. So I've got a fairly good level of expertise when it comes to what's realistic. So as they kind of showed us what, you know, the the flow was and the prices of their products were, I had this gut feeling just hearing it initially that this isn't, this, this doesn't add up. There, there's something missing here. Like there's not going to be a way to break even. So for this instance, to communicate that to them, I didn't just come out and say that. I said, hey, let's jump on a call next week and let's talk about this. And then I kind of put my detective hat on and I started to just break down all of the numbers and go based off of kind of the industry averages of what I've seen, analyzing their funnel, deep diving into their funnel, going into the historical performance that this client has achieved as well, starting to break all of these numbers down. And the numbers I was coming up with myself were like, a 0.1x ROAS, a 0.2x ROAS. And I'm like, that's a far cry from a break even on the front end. So I knew that there's probably some things that I'm missing. And my goal was to uncover their internal math. So I popped up a, a Google Doc on our call and just kind of walked through like a very high level point of kind of what I was seeing, just a very, to demonstrate it in a very simple form. And then he pulled up some of their math and I was very quickly able to kind of pull out. I was like, okay, well, these two things weren't communicated with us, which is great. And they were more beneficial. They were actually going to increase their average order value. So to increase their likelihood of breaking even. But there was also a few things that just didn't make sense to me. I didn't know where they were getting their numbers from. So we jumped off the call, broke down their numbers with the, the new insights. And it was like, a 0.4x ROAS. So still a far cry from what's going on. But knowing that sets the stage for me as a strategist to now be able to come forward and say, this is what we see based on this situation. Here's how we can address that. If we want to break even on the front end in this situation, here are some of the recommendations that we can make, which was reanalyzing their offer, also starting to look at some other things that we're going to be able to do. But the benefit that we do have with this customer is we've been doing a lot of this awareness and consideration and brand building efforts for some time. So we do have a pool of a warmer audience that we will be able to get some, some good results initially, but I don't want to put all my money on all my eggs in that basket and set these super, super high expectations. We want to make sure that we have all of these fundamentals in place to set them up for success. And I think that's a pretty important thing to kind of lean into a little bit here and hit on is like the need for transparency from your agency or your marketing team. If you are like a marketing leader and they are lying to you or not, not lying, but not being clear about expectations to you and you are then presenting that upstream, you're going to be the one that looks like a fool to the boss, right? So it's really important to make sure that you have trusted partners or team members that do are okay being open and calling out any discrepancies, like the old 
Toyota assembly line, anybody can pull the lever to stop the line. Yeah, it's, you know, it's always going to be better to ask questions. It's always going to be better to, you know, to confirm twice before you kind of pull the trigger on something as opposed to not double checking, not getting confirmation. Because when we're dealing with larger businesses, we're dealing with a point of contact and then they might have a marketing team and then they might have another external agency that they're working with. There's a lot of layers of communication. So we give the benefit of the doubt to the person that we're talking to, to go, they might not actually even know all of the things. They might have just been communicated to them that this is the goal and these are the expectations. So we have to have some empathy when we approach these conversations and just be open, open up the conversation and just kind of take it from there. But they are not usually fun conversations to have when we're telling clients that what they're expecting to achieve probably isn't going to happen. But it's just kind of par for the course. We're in this space where there's so many unforeseen things. We had a, I had a scenario just uh, yesterday, actually, where we have a client that's in the process of getting a, an approval for a restricted ad category. So they wanted to run a Labor Day promotion and all of their ads are rejected. And it's technically 100% out of our control. But it's just another thing where we just got to open up a conversation and here's the situation, knowing that they might not be happy about it, but we got to have those conversations to strengthen that partnership. Because as an agency working with a customer, the stronger that partnership is, the better we're going to be able to get buy into things like what we're talking about, awareness and consideration and branding. It's all of these things are intertwined together. Yeah, I, I kind of question myself sometimes if these things are actually are actually intertwined, or if they're really just the same thing with different names all the time. Oh, I, yeah. I was thinking about when we were talking about low hanging fruit. And that's what Facebook goes after first. If we think of this in terms of that's really just Facebook going after people who know your product. Mm -hmm. The next level up, I mean, you're really advertising against everybody in your category. So if you're only doing conversion ads, then your only hope is that somebody, one of your competitors has made a customer aware of the solutions out there and you better hope they find your product. So that's why it's important for you to be at that kind of category level you know, making people aware of actual other solutions to their problem. And it just can't keep going up upstream. It's all the same thing. Facebook calls it like breakdown effect. And it's just, you know, Eugene Schwartz levels of awareness, marketing funnels, customer journey. They're all the same thing. Well, yeah, it, it 100% is. And I find this, I find this comical when I see people in their marketing and they're just relabeling the same things and they're calling it their own unique mechanism. And it's literally the same thing. And like 90% of what I see is just taking like Eugene Schwartz's work and they call it something else. And then it's their, their proprietary system. And it's like, well, no, not really. So you're a hundred percent, right? Like it's just the language people use. A lot of times they're using that language to create brand. Yeah. They're trying to create something that's easy to remember that people can see them as a diff having a differentiation inside of the market, even though it's the same thing. They're just calling it something different, but it distills down to branding. Yeah. I mean, we're totally guilty of that too. I mean, as, I think we're maybe more guilty than most. We have like trademark names for every little thing we do. And it is about brand and like trying to create a language and a, um, a culture around the things that we do. Yeah, and it comes like there's there's like ethical and less ethical ways to do things because it all comes down to persuasion and influence. And as marketers, we know these things. It's like, you know, you put somebody in a white white lab coat in a supplement ad and there's automatically a higher level of authority associated with these people. So but it's, you know, when you're trying to create a way to make it easy for people to understand. But I think I'm biased because I obviously see what all of the other marketers are doing. So I'm just like, oh, like that's not unique, but to somebody on the other end, it can be completely, you know, new to them. Yeah. So as you move away from conversions and go to some of these increasingly broad um, advertising objectives, the squishier the metrics get in the attribution. Talk yes. a little bit about like yes. how we think about that and communicate that. Cause that's, the, I think that's the biggest, um, challenge in this digital space is perceived attribution that exists yeah it is 
tricky and i would say this is one that i like actually lose sleep over is trying to identify a measurement model for this stuff so if we think of attribution models we have first touch last touch we have linear we have full impact which is like a wicked reports attribution model we have full path and time decay and there's probably some other ones in there all of these are effectively relying on a click or an opt-in as a touch point none of them are really taking into consideration anything that doesn't involve a, a click and that right there inherently causes a massive gap when it comes to measurement because if we think of old school and we think of tv it's all impression based so how do you assess the level of success that a impression or a view led to a sale when it 100 percent does we know that it's going to be anywhere from eight to 22 touch points for somebody to to become a customer those aren't all clicks it's not that they clicked on 22 ads it's not that they you know read 22 blog posts it's that there was you know they might have saw three videos they might have read two blog posts they downloaded a lead magnet they booked a call and then they became a customer so inside of that path there are things that we can't track there are certain tools out there so i know northbeam is one where they have they use ai and machine learning and they can they do model views so this is something that i actually was digging into with a client recently where it's typically a big issue when we see a hundred percent view through conversions on on facebook especially when we're running ads on multiple platforms because if we see conversions on google and we see view through conversions on facebook we don't know if we're double counting conversions and we don't know if the view is the click on the what we see as a view conversion on facebook is a click on on google so we have this massive dilemma an interesting thing about for example northbeam is they start to model this data so we had a client where we were running some retargeting campaigns and they were all view through conversions so we're seeing really competitive results and then i'm like going and i look at just looking at clicks and i can see that we're not getting any conversions go to meta i can see they're all view through conversions i go back to this model data and i can see that when i look at their model data their sophisticated algorithm created by nasa level scientists is showing that these views are contributing to sales we know this to be true or else these brands like coca-cola and pepsi wouldn't be billion dollar companies if views and impressions didn't contribute to their success so tracking this is incredibly difficult and something that i have conversations with our team non-stop so i think in the simplest form we can start to analyze like softer metrics like pre-click metrics in terms of how these are working on platform are we getting engagement on our videos is it stopping the thumb is it holding attention and we can see that we're starting to gauge the attention there but in terms of just showing videos and knowing its exact contribution we almost have to rely on a view through to be able to have some resemblance of something we're able to measure unless we have a tool that's able to track incremental performance increase utilizing views or we have to zoom out in the time frame that we're analyzing performance that's the biggest thing i was talking to one of our media buyers and he was asking a question about how do we know if these views are working and he said well if we look out over a long enough time horizon a period of time where when we weren't utilizing that and a period of time when we were utilizing that we should see an incremental improvements in our performance and if we don't then it likely wasn't a contributing factor and that's kind of what i've <laughs> the long and short of it like the best i can get to it with the tools that i have at my disposal right now but it's i know it's working selling my intuition to a client isn't always something that's easy but it's just when we can communicate how the buying journey works and we can start to involve multiple things like awareness plus consideration plus lead generation and clicks through to a blog post and we start to encompass all of the things inside of what we're utilizing as a marketing strategy 
it's a little bit easier as opposed to just saying, hey, we're going to go spend, you know, this much money on a Super Bowl ad because it gets this many impressions. Yeah. I guess on a client by client basis, it's a gut feel that as an industry, I mean, as you said the long and short of it, which is, again, Bennett and Fields, like they've proven that the biggest, well, not proven, correlated the biggest mm-hmm. lever for long term pro- uh, profit, I think is what they're saying. Yeah, the biggest lever for pro- long term profit is increased reach. Yeah. And that's the biggest correlation between the two. And they measured all the things for brand building versus act- like spending more in activation. It always comes down to the bigger the reach over the long term, the bigger the profit. Yeah. And even even very simply, if, I, if I'm talking to a creator that's just creating content on TikTok, what's the biggest thing? Consistency over the long term and increased reach. And then we just extrapolate that out. Like it's it's the same thing. Like the what makes us successful just creating content on Instagram isn't much different than what creates success when we're talking about a billion dollar company. It's establishing a brand and progressively increasing our reach over time. So when we're talking, we're not talking about, you know, a company doing hundred thousand dollars a year. We're typically talking about, you know, small, medium sized businesses and the, you know, the millions and tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue. And when we want to talk about how do we start to carve out percentage in our market, branding is so incredibly important. And where we can really start to waste money is if we are avoiding that and missing that component, because many of the customers that we work with are in very saturated markets. They're not, and it's very difficult today, I find, to have a product that is 100% unique to the market and you have no competition. When you got a, a lot of competition in a saturated market, well, how do you differentiate yourself? Well, you differentiate yourself by having a more notable brand that more people know about. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say here? Yeah, I think you had kind of talked a little bit about um, beforehand you know, like the Alex Hermosi model with his $100 million leads launch. Give a little backstory on that and talk about, you know, the success he had in brand building versus like paid, really. Yeah, well, well, first off, right now I'm trying to model the Hermosi beard to see if I get any incremental lift with my social media following. But he his book is really interesting. So the audio book is free. You can listen to it on his podcast. I have the, the physical copy behind me that I'm reading. But... What was cool about what he did was he had all of these lead generation ideas inside of his book and he utilized all of them for the launch of his book. So he was able to pull in a lot of proof. He outlined inside of his webinar how he utilized, I believe, through organic content, he generated. Okay, sorry, take a step back. He had 500,000 people sign up for his webinar for his book launch. Out of those 500,000 people, there was over 200,000 people that came from organic content. Zero money in paid ads, just 100% organic pieces of content across the social media platforms, TikTok, Threads, LinkedIn, YouTube, um, Facebook, across Twitter, I believe as well, or X. You know, But if you look at how he breaks that down, that didn't happen over the last six months. What built him up to the point of being able to achieve that was like four years of heavy investment into social media content, YouTube content, podcasts. But he also compared that to how much he generated from ads, which was like a hundred and some thousand people. So he generated more leads organically only because of how renowned he was able to build his brand 1.5 million subscribers on youtube but also something that people miss is that the effectiveness of his paid content is amplified by the growth of his brand if you now see an alex hermosi ad you are already familiar with alex hermosi because of the size of his brand so when he goes out and says i had a 55 percent conversion rate on my landing page if you just model Alex Hermosi's landing page, you can't expect to get the same result because you don't necessarily have these intangible things that he has associated with his paid marketing, which is brand. 
And what we talk about all the time is, yes, we need to have a sound social media content strategy, but we're in the business of hacking that to amplify and expedite that process through paid advertising. Yeah. I mean, the best day to start your brand is you know, like five years ago. The second best day is today. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, I've been, my, my son's playing like basketball. He's like in the six, six year old, but I see a lot of like up to 10 year olds and they're all walking around with prime energy drinks. I was oh. like, what the heck is prime energy drink? It's everywhere. Well, mm -hmm. it turns out, I think it's Logan Paul's brand. Yep. He has this massive audience that he's built up over the last probably 10 years, launches this prime energy drink. Is it not energy, but like hydration drink? And both. Is, both. is it both? Okay. Yeah. And it's going to do $100 million this year, mm -hmm. first year. All because there's so much brand around this person. You associate that person with the product. And now it's a massive launch, super safe launch in that sense, because your, your capital is not at risk for launching something cold to a market because you have, you're leveraging a brand to launch something, which is exactly yeah. what Hermosi did. Exactly. And the really interesting piece there is that Logan Paul is the brand and it benefited the launch of Prime. Prime wasn't the brand. Logan Paul is the brand. So this is something that I was talking about on a few sales calls and a few pitches that we had recently. And I use this exact example. I'm like, look at, look at Logan Paul and Prime. Hundred million dollar company. How was that achieved? Not through paid advertising, but through brand, but we can utilize paid advertising to create brand. And that's what people miss is we don't have to just 100% rely on organic efforts. We can utilize organic efforts, amplify them with paid, complement them with conversions, and we're getting the best of all of the worlds. But brand works nonstop. Look at Logan Paul, look at Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne Johnson is now worth a billion dollars. Why? He's an actor built up a brand then he launched zoa and terramana tequila like now he's worth a billion dollars um connor mcgregor with his what did he launch is it a vodka i can't remember. he watched he launched a liquor as well just non-stop ryan reynolds did the same thing with aviation gin and uh was it mint mobile mm -hmm. uh just non-stop you see these people that are building brands turning them into businesses the evidence is everywhere like, do I need to show you a case study? Like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, like we buy because of brand association and we, we can create that. Yeah. What's really interesting about that is how the use of celebrity has flipped completely because it used to be a brand would endorse, have a celebrity endorsement, right? Like a, a Jordan where the brand would be clearly paying somebody to do something. But now it's the other way where the celebrity is driving the brand and not necessarily the, where the brand is just associating themselves. I think that something important to note, though, is that if you take someone like Dwayne Johnson, we can't discount the fact that paid advertising did, in fact, build the brand of Dwayne Johnson. So he was in movies. How are movies sold? TV commercials, billboards, all of these sorts of things to drive butts in seats. So butts in seats from paid advertising of the movie companies built the brand of Dwayne Johnson. Now Dwayne Johnson has taken that brand and he's translated into business success. But I think you're 100% right. People got smart. People are realizing that a really big brand can be translated into things. Look at Mr. Beast. Like yeah. he launched his candy bars and, and stuff, right? He's doing the same thing. He's taking his brand that he created and he's building businesses. So something I had a conversation about very recently was creating something bigger than the business. And it's this, this same thing. These people have something bigger than Dwayne Johnson is bigger than Tara Mana tequila. And that's why he can take that and he can apply and utilize that brand in multiple ways. Let's keep going down this Dwayne Johnson route. You know, it's, it's funny. He's a good example of something that any brand could mimic and that he tested his brand back in the WWF days. I think is when he started, he went through a variety of different personas to figure out what was going to resonate the most with the audience mm -hmm. and it ended up being the people's champion. Right. And that continued all the way through what he does now. So even getting into Terramana tequila, it is at a price point 
where it is the people's like a, a pretty mass market tequila versus something like uh was it Calamigas, which is higher end, more expensive. Dwayne Johnson is like the top end of what is a mass market price. So it's still quality because it's top end, but it's still achievable by the mass people, mass, uh, I guess the mass audience, which mm-hmm. then makes me think he's just going to run for president and win. <laughs> <laughs> I would vote for him. I'm not American, but so it's yeah. not going to count, but I'll vote for him in spirit. But yeah, and I think something else that people also miss is the time horizon. Mm-hmm somebody might not even know who Dwayne Johnson is. And then they, they see him on a, you know, on his social media with drinking Zoa, but he's also like, if you look at his brand, everything he creates is on brand. So like he has this massive gym and he's always working out and he's this big character in all of his movies. So launching an energy drink made sense. Partnering with Under Armour makes sense. You know, tequila. Now he's got his like cheat meals and he's sipping his tequila on the rocks. Like it's it's still all brand. It's still all brand. And it's creating this synergy. Now Terramana's building his brand. He's building the brand of Terramana. And he's now doing that and just dipping his toes in all of these other buckets. Yeah. But just I think one thing for brand brands to consider is to make sure that they have an ongoing conversation with their audience to find out what the brand is because in the end the brand isn't what the company says it's what people say about the company and how they feel about the company and that feedback loop is what's going to drive a successful brand within that niche yeah i think that's a really really important point i think one of the ways that people can waste money on cold traffic is by running ads based on what they think is going to work this is my avatar. This is their pain points. This is our message. Like you, you might think this is their pain points, but they're going to vote with their attention. They're going to vote with the content that gets more engagement. They're going to vote with the ads that drive conversions. So a really big mistake people can make is trying to make those assumptions and not letting the community, just like you said, give them the feedback to drive how they make those changes. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else was on our list here. Um, we had um, maybe modeling tactics on others. We can hit on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. How do you coach or talk to people when they are like, I just want to mimic Russell Brunson or Hermosi? Totally. I think it, I think we did hit on this. It is understanding the intangibles that went into what they built it. So I just actually made a tweet about this where like don't model funnels, model what they did and the practices they did to make that funnel work. So yes, Russell Brunson is running a challenge funnel. So now your business wants to run a challenge funnel. I get it. It makes sense. Like the industry leader is doing this. Let's also do that. However, Russell Brunson has a nine-figure SaaS company. Before he started the SaaS company, he had created a lot of success with direct response marketing and affiliate marketing. He also has these masterminds and owns a bunch of brands, Brands runs a, you know, a very a yearly conference with thousands of attendees. So there's things there that you can't model. So we can't expect the same results. So it's just in these situations, it's just very open and honest and transparent and candorous conversation with people where it's like, okay, we can do this, but let's understand that you have no social media following and there are probably not as many people are going to buy from you because brand awareness influences the success of your, of your marketing. Yeah. So we've talked about this at a, a very, fairly like conceptual level. Mm-hmm. Let's maybe get into a little bit of like some, strategy and tactics of yeah let's what do should people be doing for brand versus activation or conversion yeah so this is a great point so i think that there's a lot of context here so i'm going to assume that back ends in place we don't need work on the conversion or optimization side of things we got email marketing in place we got the data and tracking and we got the fundamentals in place that any good agency should be working with their clients to get in place when we want to look at how do we avoid running into this tapping out of our market you know having to say our creatives fatigued how do we set something up in place 
I wish I could give numbers of like 10% here, 20% there, you know, 80% here. Those numbers don't add up. But it's going to be a combination of very simply, it's like our ACC method, which is awareness, consideration, and conversion. Most marketers that are going to be tuning in are very familiar with a conversion ad. But we need to take a step back and understand what is a conversion ad doing? Who is a conversion ad targeting? A conversion ad is targeting somebody that already knows what their problem is. They already know what solution they need. They're just trying to figure out who to buy in from. That is the person that a conversion ad is targeted to. Oftentimes, it's going to be 1% to 3% of the market at any given time. And you know, you're going to be using things like case studies and testimonials and social proof and to, to sell them on your product. However, if we want to scale and we want to be able to improve the results that that gets, there's all of these other things that happen in the awareness and consideration stage. In the awareness stage, this is effectively they have a problem. They don't know what the solution is. In the consideration stage, they know what their problem is, and now they're trying to assess which solution that they should go with. We can now utilize our marketing to carry people through their buying journey to get them to be in the point of the conversion stage. It's like creating a conveyor belt. We want to, we're going to, we don't want to just be at that conversion stage. We're bringing them through along this conveyor belt from the awareness to the consideration into the conversion stage. And then we just rinse and repeat. And when we do that, that allows so much more scale for our business than just focusing on this small portion of the pie that is going after the smallest segment of the audience. Yeah. And as far as budget ratios go, I know like the, the goal that we're always trying to get to is like 40% is conversion. Mm -hmm. I think there's always a lot of work to do to get to that. Um, but on the creative side, how do you think about these differently? And I, I think this is something that Facebook is complicit in telling people to do conversion because they were always like 15 second video ads have the highest conversion, mm -hmm. which is a very narrow view of all the ads that go into something because the more you get away from conversion, I, th I think the longer the ads have to be to educate or entertain. Challenge me. <laughs> I think I would challenge you on that. I think that... If I'm thinking of who's going to invest the most time with me, and it's likely somebody that is ready to make a decision, they're in that research phase. They're the people that are going on Google searching for a solution to their problem. It's going to be somebody in that consideration to conversion stage. I think in the awareness stage, we can be a little bit more short because we're just trying to capture somebody's attention, get them starting to understand our brand or get their attention that, oh, they're, they have this problem. This person has a solution. There's some old marketing talk, and I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like, if you can describe a problem as good or better than they can, they're going to assume that you have the solution. Hmm. So I do think that the short form, and I do think that, I don't think necessarily Facebook, I think almost like the TikTokification of the, the, the community right now has really played into this. People interact in different ways. We got the millennials, we got Gen Z. The behavior of people is changing. And I also think this is why branding is becoming so much more important. People don't want to, the, the younger the person, the less likely they are to purchase from a company. They want transparency. They want honesty. They want to have a brand that they align with. They don't want the same old marketing tactics that worked and were sold 25, 30, 40, 50 years ago, this high pressure, you know, all of this urgency, all of this scarcity, those things work less and less and less and less. And they have to be used in very tactful ways. Um, but I do think that we can probably get a little bit more of a time commitment when people are in that consideration and conver uh, conversion phase, because they're really trying to dig into that research. The intent has started to change. They're not just looking around or probably even maybe not even present of what their problem is now they're really trying to seek out that solution and that's also where we start to see our google ads perform really well yeah and if we're thinking in terms of facebook those would be kind of our video view ads and our potentially website traffic ads things where people were trying to get them to engage for longer periods of time whether that is mm -hmm. watching a 15 seconds of a video or longer or 
getting them interested enough to go learn more on the website. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where really we need to start to think out of the box and not just try and think of, we need 15 to 30 second short form videos and that's all we can run across TikTok and Meta and, and YouTube shorts. It's like, no, like step into the shoes of the person that's looking to purchase. Yes, that may be great at a higher level, but is a 15 second video going to communicate enough for somebody to purchase from you? Probably not. Can Are many people running longer videos? No. Well, where are people running longer videos? On YouTube. Well, what are people doing on YouTube? Researching. How can we leverage that inside of our marketing? We just need to start to think like our customers. I was almost, I almost swore there. Um, but I've seen success running full webinars as ads on, on Facebook. Why? Because the person that's actually interested is going to watch it. Yeah. It can act as a filter. You know, it can act as a way to filter out tire kickers because we're putting the information that they need to make a decision in front of them. So there's a lot of ways that we can leverage our marketing when we start to understand the buying journey. But Landon, the click-through rate's so low on that webinar. Exactly. Why are you I still know. running it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is just where we, we educate people on how marketing works. It's an inverse relationship. High click-through rates, high attention, sometimes have a negative correlation with conversion. Yeah. Um, I guess... I can go a little bit into the trick I used for finding ads. So in the tier 11 advertising, we're running, trying to run like all the objectives. And I didn't know where I was going to find these ads from. So what I ended up doing is we've been putting out a lot of social media over the last nine months or so. I took, I downloaded the statistics from all, for all of that across Meta and YouTube. And then I ran it through chat GPT. Perfect. It used to be called code interpreter. It's called something else now, like, data analytics yeah data and analyzer said, or something yeah here's what i want to do is find the best social media to run at ads for each of these objectives go and it would just find for reach campaigns those ads that had the most views and if for kind of that consideration phase it was kind of like the social media that had the longest view time and then for the conversion if there was a click associated with that social media that was what they would suggest for the conversion and that was kind of a shortcut just to find things that would potentially resonate at each of these. Now we you want know, to build on top of that eventually, but mm -hmm. I think using utilizing tools like that really takes a lot of the thinking, not thinking, but researching out of it that would normally go into figuring out what to do at each of these stages. Yeah, absolutely. If we're not looking at the data, we're just we're just guessing. Even with the data, we're still making a hypothesis. Yeah but it is more educated and it's rooted in something that is true. And if you're looking at organic, it is rooted in something that the consumer has voted on, on what's going on. And it's important because this is something not everybody does with, with our accounts at tier 11, we're reviewing our clients, social media nonstop. That's where a lot of our best ads are coming from, from their social media content. And then if you're, you take what that data you got inside of, the code interpreter there's other things you can get from there the ones that got the most impressions the one that got the most the, the longest retention and then you start to pull out you know where are the commonalities where where do these things overlap what themes are there and you can utilize that to drive what you utilize in your conversion ads or maybe you use that to create additional content and blog content and podcasts and things like that yeah well, one thing I've known about our content is talking about brands and brand stuff it tends to do really well. And oh, good. We'll keep making podcasts then. <laughs> cool. Any uh, final thoughts on uh, why running conversion ads to cold traffic is a waste of money? No, I think just to kind of summarize, I think it becomes incredibly important to branch out the type of ads you're running if you're in a saturated market. Branding is going to be much more important especially if you're also wanting to grow and you want to spend substantial amounts of money in advertising and have a substantial size of business might be a little bit less relevant if you are spending a thousand dollars a month in ads just trying to get a couple customers here and there some of these techniques might not be applicable to your business but many of our clients are spending 50 100 you know a few hundred thousand dollars in ads they're in saturated markets where there are a lot of competition it becomes incredibly important to diversify how you're spending your money 
I think we need to really start to avoid creating problems for ourselves as an advertiser. We need to be careful when we're modeling, you know, <laughs> modeling the competition, not just blindly doing it and understanding that we're going to have diminishing returns, but there's things that we can do inside of our advertising efforts to, to lessen the effect of that. Excellent. Well, for me, I'd say that don't expect your conversion ads to build brand and don't expect your brand ads to convert. They will do both of those occasionally, but you can't do both well at the same time. Exactly. Understand what you're doing and why and how they work together. Yeah. Great. Well, Landon, thank you very much. I always enjoy talking about this stuff with you. And then if you are a company looking to build brand or to drive more conversions or ideally do both at the same time, head over to tier11.com, click the big pink button, and we would love to chat with you. Till next time, I'm Tom Meredith. Thanks again, Landon, and uh, catch you later.